Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of I Never Knew Podcast or Inc. by Life Coach Maureen. So excited to have everyone here. Our community is growing huge as we do our stories and share with one another to uplift and help one another understand we're all going through the same thing. And our experiences are ex in existence to help one another. I have a very, very cool guest with me today. And I'm so happy he agreed to be on here because I found him. And his story is so compelling, guys. And, and he's if you are watching on YouTube, you're going to see his beautiful smile. And he's just light. He's just full of light. And he's so handsome. And when you hear his story, you're going to look at him and go, wow, you know, all the struggle he went through and he's got this big radiant smile. So this is what I love. So today's podcast guest is Adam Rivera. He is 34 years old. He was born and raised in Tampa, Florida. He served in the army from 2008 to 2012, did the four years, like me and my ex-husband did the four years and said, get the heck out. We are not lifers. Can't handle this. You don't own me. So <laughs> we have that connection. Uh, and he was in both Iraq and Afghanistan. After the army, he did armed security at government contracted facilities, nightclubs, residential areas, college, and for celebrities. Ooh, yes, I know you guys inquiring minds want to know who. I will definitely dig in that one. He's currently not working because he had a tragic accident that happened on October 18th, 2021. Wow, that's not long ago. That's not even a year yet. And he was driving his motor scooter. He was cut off from a work van and slammed, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> into the side of the vehicle. He broke, oh, he broke both legs, his left elbow, his neck, his back, fractured his ribs, the left side of his face, a collapsed lung, and needed four blood transfusions. He is rebuilding from the accident today and training to compete in triathlons no later than the end of 2023. I love timelines and I love goals. <clears throat> he is also writing a book and starting a blog, which he's using to put himself out there to help people, which is why he is my guest today. He's willing to be vulnerable with his story to help others. He wants to help change the negative perspectives that society is misinterpreting and going to eventually reach out to hospitals, juvenile detention centers, and therapists. I'm going to add life coaches in there to help trouble kids and survivors from tragic accidents, build the confidence and strength to keep growing and becoming better versions of themselves. Whew, amazing. Welcome, Adam, my friend. Good morning. Good morning. I am so, so excited to be here today. Oh, you, you know, it's, it's tenfold for me because just reading your story, I was like, I got to know this guy. I got to know him and I have to hear his inspiring story and how he's going to take this thing that happened and bring it out into the world and something good. So as we know, it's storytelling. So we start from the beginning. Tell us, What's going on? Tell us when your life changed, when you realized, wow, this, this is where I'm going to go now on my path. Well, I will say that I've maybe have 15 of those moments. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. <laughs> it started off young. Um, I wanted to join the military in high school. Uh, before I got out the military, I, my grandmother had a, uh, a nightmare of me dying in Afghanistan. So that killed my entire dream. I told myself I'll ne never do it. But then I ended up falling in love with a girl who joined the military. So I joined oh. to follow her. But Those darn was, women, you know, they'll make you do things you don't intend to do, you know? <laughs> six days, six days after I signed up, I was in Fort Sill, Oklahoma at doing field artillery. That's how fast. The day she left is the day I signed up. And six days later is the day I, yeah. So oh. that, that left. And then after Iraq and Afghanistan, um, I realized that it wasn't the war. It wasn't the the struggles. It wasn't the stresses, the fear and danger. It wasn't that. It was honestly just horrible leadership that pushed me out of the military um, because I just it was just a, it was a different my unit was just a different uh, breed. And I go off of logic rather than I, my, my rank is higher than you. So then that pushed me into, uh, into just doing protection work when I got out of the military, which 
uh, was amazing. Um, I worked at colleges. I worked at nightclubs. I worked at residential areas. I had the pleasure of uh, uh, Fetty Wap. I did security for Fetty Wap. Uh, Lil Dicky was by far the most amazing. Um, if if anybody knows Lil Dicky, he is exactly who he is in his TV show in real life. <laughs> yes. Um, he's amazing. Uh, Kevin Gates was one. Um, yeah, I had a, a quite a few. And then from there, I um, I wanted to get away from the protection uh, protection area only because of just the 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 mindset of today's society. Um, I wanted to help people, and a lot of the scenarios that I was in was was things that people were creating just so they can film. And I said, you know what, I I don't want to 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 lose my purpose because of somebody's attention uh, or craving for attention. So I so I left that, and then I started doing um, private investigating. And that was amazing, dangerous, beyond dangerous, but it was, it was home. It gave me a lot, plenty of time to read books, to work on myself. I was living in my van 20 hours out of the day. So it was awesome, but uh, I needed, but I didn't have a, a family life. And from there, I then started doing tower climbing. So I was on the radio towers up to 300, 400 feet up in the sky, building the, the radio towers. And I did that for about two years until I got hurt. Um, freak accident. I had a, a thorn hit a puncture my tendon, and it's and it uh within 24 hours I had to have my entire hand filleted just so they can rid the the infection. It was horrible, so I had to leave for there, and that's when I uh went into the uh hospitality area, and that's when my accident happened. I was actually on my way to work, uh nine o'clock in the morning, nine thirty in the morning. I had to be there at ten, and I wake up three days later in a hospital. Oh my gosh. All, all I keep like thinking as you're telling your story is like pivot, 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 you know, the shift. And, and what's so admirable about that is you kept following, like, this doesn't feel as good as I wanted to. This doesn't feel, I need to do this. This feels better. And I love that because so many of us stay stagnant in the things that are mediocrity and we just think, okay, good enough. And my generation, I mean, I'm old enough to be your mama and we saw a beautiful picture of your mama. Um, my generation was just do this thing for 30 years, then retire, you know, just suck it up and be unhappy. And that's what I love about you and your generation is nah, man, we're not going to stay in these things that don't feel good to us. When you said it wasn't in alignment with you or, or what I was thinking was it wasn't in alignment with you. You saw this thing that didn't sit well with you, with your values. You're like, that's not who I am. I'm not false. I, I want to be my authentic self. And, and we pay attention. If, if we pay attention to that gut feeling of, Ooh, this just doesn't sit well with me. It's like, I'm all about justice and fairness. I'm not going to go rob a bank because it wouldn't sit well with me. I love that you're like, yeah, even though I loved what I did with all these celebrities, um, it's my values were more important to me. My worth is more important to me. So, wow, what a, what a shift. So I'm sure, like you said, 15 different moments, but the, the big one obviously was not even a year ago, that accident. I mean, when you woke up, after three days, what, what was going through your mind? Honestly, it felt like a dream. So um, I was blessed to not remember my accident at all. I, all I remember was being on, on the, the scooter and blinking and then waking up. And I have two people hovering over me, uh, with my mom and the doctor. I think there was another nurse. And I'm just sitting there looking at them and, I, uh, and I'm tired. And they say, do you know where you are? And I said, it looks like I'm in a hospital. And then they said, yes. They said, three days ago, you were in, a, you were in an accident that practically killed you. Um, uh, I, I try to look down and I can't because I have a neck brace on. And then my arm is, is completely uh, bound up. And then my leg has a huge boot on it. And the pain was excruciating, but I didn't feel fear. For some reason, I wasn't afraid. I wasn't nervous. You know, the only thing I was thinking about is who's taking care of my dog. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Yeah. That's the, that's the only thought that came to my head because I've been through so many things in my life that this was like, okay, cool. Well, 
um, oh, I'm glad that y'all are here. When do I go home? You know, that's literally how my mind works. I was always just, just, you know, I have to do, I have to do, I have to do. And they said, no, they said, unfortunately, um, you're not going home today. And they said, it, you may, it may take a while for you to go home. And then even once you go home, you're not going to your home. You need to be with somebody who can take care of you. And that's where I started to, to slowly get a little bit of stress because I'm just like, okay, cool. What about my apartment? You know, what about my bills? What about all of these things that without, I can't work and, you know, have my uh, managers even talk, you know, text to see if I was okay, or if they just thought I just never showed up, like what's going on. Um, and then my mom, she left and the doctors came up to me and they said, I want to prepare you uh, so that it, when it, when you do get this uh, notice, it's not going to be a surprise. And I want you to just know that you may never get out of a wheelchair. You may never get out of a wheelchair, but if you do get out of a wheelchair, you are going to have to have assistance, period. And even then, I I was just like, nah, <laughs> I I don't. That's not that's not even part of my my DNA. You know, that you can't tell me to stop. I used to do triathlons. You know, I've I've swam with sharks. I've jumped out of planes. I've been I climbed mount I climbed every mountain in the island of Oahu. Like, and you're telling me that I can't ever walk again? I said no, nah. and. That's basically it. Uh, they said the the doctors would get angry with me every single day. You know, get rest, get rest, get rest, get rest, get rest. And I don't know if it was just my rebellious spirit or if it was another spirit pulling me. But I'm just like, well, how do you get the strength to get out of bed if you never get out of bed? Oh, and yes. so, so uh, within a week, <laughs> within a week. Oh, okay. So, so fractured left the fractured the left side of my face, fractured my my ribs. Uh, broke my neck, broke my lower back, broke my elbow, broke both legs. And I was out of the hospital in a week. Oh my gosh. I was out of the hospital in a week. Um, <laughs> I will say though, that I was complaining about my right leg every day, every day. Cause that's, you know, I had still had to try to walk and I had to try to do physical therapy. And every single day I would tell them like, my leg hurts, my leg hurts, my leg hurts. And after a month of me walking, uh, we went to do a, a checkup on my left leg to make sure that my bones were healing because I don't know if I told you my left knee or f from my left knee all the way to my left ankle is all titanium. Wow. It's all titanium because what they had to do is they had to go through the top of my knee, slide in a, a, a titanium uh, rod, bring my bones back together, then have it going through that one. And they had to nail them or screw them to my bones at my kneecap and then in my ankle just for it to be able to, to bind the bone again. So we were doing a checkup for that and I was still complaining about my right leg. And my mom said, listen, I understand that, you know, that, that y'all may say that it may be a soft tissue injury and everything else, but he's almost broke almost every bone in his body. Can y'all just do an x-ray just to check? My right leg was broken too. <laughs> Go mama. Go mama. Mama's no. And you know, your body, you know, your body. And the, the, I have to just throw in the medical field. I was in it for 28 years. And as a patient, I just find it so frustrating because you know, something's not right. <clears throat> They'll run all these tests. Oh, everything's fine. Oh, you know, it's almost this assumption. Everybody's case is the same. And you have these things, you knew something was not right. And you're walking around for a week with a broken right leg. Oh, a month. oh my, a month. A it was a whole month. It was on, it was on, uh, it was four Fridays after that we were, we, I got my x-ray and then come that Tuesday, I went to another surgeon and they said, um, they said, no, you need to get, get operated on immediately. So I did that. And then when I went back to the hospital, they saw that I got that. They told me that I should have never even got it fixed. They said it would have healed on its own. And to this day, they will not, they will not look at me anymore. No. They said, okay, well, you have another surgeon, surgeon work on it, then have him look at it for now on. No That's accountability, it. no yeah. accountability. And yeah. just, just for uh measure, I'm not going to the airport through security with you because you're going to get flagged and you're going to take forever to go through the uh, metal detector with me. So I'm just not doing it. I have not registered through any metal detector since that accident i have been to dc i've been to vegas since then i've been to the courthouse several times and the only time i got binged was because of my zipper in my pants that was it <laughs> okay well now we know these security measures with nsa are working fabulously <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for awesome. I, have, 
at least maybe what 30 percent of titanium titanium in my body but i guess i don't know if titanium registers i don't know i don't know apparently how not apparently only zippers um are are on the uh, list the hit list for uh, terrorism on a plane so <laughs> <laughs> Wow. How, just how amazing. And I mean, look at you. Are you surprised at how fast uh, you were able to heal? Or do you feel like, let me backtrack. The fact that I think in, in, when we have these medical things and people tell us, here's the report or whatever, I've always said, don't listen to the report, listen to what you know is going to happen and what you believe you envision yourself walking. Don't worry about the wheelchair. I as well was told when I was 38 years old, I would be in a wheelchair uh, in 10 years from um, rheumatoid arthritis. And I'm like, oh, uh-uh, not going to happen. So I do relate to exactly what you said. You're like, I don't, you, say what you want. We were strong enough to say, nah, what you say isn't true. What I believe is true. So strength of spirit, you are. You're just a... You're a go-getter. It's who you are. It's who your soul is. You're like, no, that's not going to happen. So do you think that is what helped you heal to where you are today? A few things helped me heal. So as a life coach, I'm pretty sure you, you know, when it comes to like goals and, and, and habits and stuff like that, when you typically look at the mountain uh, uh, that you're, that you're trying to get to life gets hard. But if you were to, if you were to look at that one step and you're not even looking at the mountain, you'll be going, going, going and not even realize. And so the moment you start realizing that you're tired, you're already halfway up, you know, rather than looking at it, you're just like, ah, oh. so a hundred feet up. That's how I did this. So I never saw me walking, but I never saw me not walking. All I did is, all right, cool. Well, what can I do at this moment? Yes. You know, uh, is it just, just forcing myself to get up and, and sit up for a little bit and then slowly force myself down? that I started doing that. And of course I started building muscle. I started building, um, actually, you know, I started building, uh, what is it called? What is it? like a callus basically, uh, in my mind of now I'm going through this un discomfort so often that now it's easy. Yeah. Right. And then going through it one time and remembering how bad it was and never doing it again. And then two days later, forcing yourself to do it. No, I did it consistently, consistently to the, to the point where people ask me now, like, yo, are, like what's, what still hurts? And I said, I don't know. I said, I'm just so used to being just uncomfortable that this just feels normal now. So now I'm, I don't feel pain. Yes. Yes. It's like that exposure therapy. Like I got to do it. And once I do it, then I'm on the other side of fear. And now I'm in the point of, okay, I'm just going to repeat it and make it a habit. And I love that your brain said, ah, nah, we don't feel anything. We don't know. It's just normal. It's my new normal. And I'm okay with my new normal accepting it's my new normal is super cool. And you're right. As a life coach, I tell everyone, don't look at the mountain. Let's take the first step on the path. And six months later, you're going to look back and go, how the heck did I do that? Well, you chunked it up. That's exactly where it was. Like even to this day, I, I, I look around and people get, people are getting tired of me actually celebrating myself, but I wake up every day. So grateful. Like, wow, I just rode 20 miles on a bike this morning. You know, wow. I, I went swimming on legs that were completely snapped. Wow. So I, so it's, it's a surprise to me every single day. Cause I don't ever look forward and be like, okay, well, you know what, this is what I'm going to do. No, I just do it. Yes. Yes. You pushed through and you, you get those wins. You know, one of my podcast guests said you can have five wins before you even start your day. And whoever is not celebrating, you're getting tired of you celebrating you. They're not your people. They're your cage. They're not your circle. So yeah, no, huh? Um, I want to celebrate the people in my life and their wins. I want to know what's going well. So that's food for thought too. We got to be cognizant of who's lifting us. You know, you don't want to feel alone. You want to have this circle around you, this, this, you know, uh, cheering section. So, um, that's really, really interesting. Now we talked before we got on how you have a fraternal twin who actually looks just like him guys. And they're both super handsome. And he as well got into an accident. I mean, what are the, what are the chances here? But you went through something to help him too. So let's talk about what happened to your brother. So he was actually leaving work and I think he was only going five miles an hour. I don't know how exactly it happened, but the, the other vehicle, it was an SUV, thought he could 
beat my brother. I don't know if he was turning or if Austin was turning and he was showing, I don't remember, but he thought that he can beat my brother and he ended and ended up just running over him and um, running over the bike, running over his helmet. So his helmet ha has the tire tread on his, on his visor. And he was pinned in between the motorcycle and the, the truck. So they actually had to lift the truck up and pull him from underneath it. And um, I remember getting the phone call and I didn't even believe it. I'm just like, man, because how he talked, he was talking just like this. He's like, yeah, I'm just letting you know. I just got a motorcycle accident. I'm just like, yeah, whatever. Come to find out he did. And the doctors told him he would never be able to raise up his arm higher than shoulder length. Um, and he's probably the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing because he looked at the doctor and said, all right, cool. And he became a, he became a, uh, a personal trainer and started doing one on pull-ups oh. with the same arm that they told him he wouldn't be able to do it. And he's like, okay, cool. Watch. I got you. There's some resilient genes going on in your family and, and boys and girls, what did we just learn? What, uh, helmets save lives. He yes. had his head, he could have had his head crushed. It would, there, this would not be the same story right now. Had he not been wearing that helmet. So mm -hmm. do not take that lightly guys use your safety equipment, but wow. Uh, you guys are just, your mother obviously was raised you guys to believe in yourselves and to believe anything is possible and no one can tell you any different. Um, I, I just, Oh my gosh, I'm so happy to even have known you here. This is, this is so freaking amazing. So as we move forward to what are you, what are you going to write about in your bike? Is it, or in your book, is it going to be a story of your life or what is it going to be about? So with the experiences that I've had in, in life, um, you, you don't really know pers perspectives of other people's until you've experienced it. You know, a lot of people don't know about a death in the family until they have a death in the family. A lot of people don't know about overcoming pain and struggles until you've had it, until you've had a ton of pain and struggles. Um, but because of what I've been through in my life, I've experienced so many different things. And I started to learn that your, your mind is a sardine can. Your mind is a sardine can. And to be able to put anything in it, sometimes you have to take certain things out. Um, and I started understanding that that you slowly but surely become your surroundings. You know, um, basically you are what you eat. You know, if you eat a whole bunch of bottom feeders, you know, catfish and stuff like that, they say that you're eating all their cells are created out of the dirt and the, the nastiness of the water. And now their cells are full of that. And now if that's all you eat, now your cells are going to be full of it. Well, I changed it up and said, you're not you. You are what you eat. You, you are what you ingest. Anything you can ingest from your touch, from your from your hearing, from the things that you watch on TV, and slowly but surely you start getting desensitized. So the the moral of the story is is it's a, a kid who grew up in a very toxic environment. You know he didn't have a support system. Um, the only support system he had was his father, but his father was gone um, weeks at a time. He was a tower climber, and. Um, so he was surrounded by his friends and his friends' parents and, you know, the, the, the society he was raised in. And so he had all these um, uh, stereotypes that he pushed on to people because of what his friends were saying. And one day he's at his garbage job. I think he was, uh, it's not a garbage job, but at the time, you know, he, he, he didn't have the, the urge to be something better. He was like, all right, cool. I'm gonna just work at a, a fast food restaurant. And then he stayed there. Uh, so while he's at his, his restaurant uh, with, his, with his friends, a group of, of cars pull up, nice BMWs and you just name them, nice cars pull up. And some guys come in in suits and ties. They know all ethnicities, all backgrounds. And they just happen to see this one black guy who is dressed in a suit and tie. Well, of course, because of his stereotypes that he put on people, he's like, wait, time out. We don't dress like that. And so he started laughing with his friends and the dude turns around and he's like, hey, um, if you don't mind me asking, are you laughing at me? The dude's like, yeah, I'm laughing at you. I said, I, he, I'm laughing at you because, you know, I think it's kind of, you know, dumb for you and your, your play dates to be talking about having a, a uh, go play golf. And he's like, well, what's the difference between me and my boys playing golf and you and your boys playing football? Like, isn't it the same thing? He's like, how about this? Instead of we, you know, instead of doing this, how about you and your friends meet up with me and my friends and we can learn something about each other. Maybe you, you might even enjoy golf. Well, of course, his friends are like, nah, no, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And he decides to still go. 
Well, long story short, he goes over there. And when he first shows up, you know, he has his baggy jeans on, his hat's all twisted, his shirt's all baggy. And the, you know, the other guy, he looks like Tiger Woods, his pants all tight, you know, nice. You got wear a belt, you know, collared shirt. And when he walks up to him, the first thing that the kid wants to do is, you know, dab him up. And he's like, no, you shake your hand. The moment he did that is now introducing something new to him. So now he's like, okay, so now because of that, that small, small scenario, now he knows how to shake a hand that can guide him later on in life. And then when he he's like, all right, cool. You know, I want you to, to swing the, uh, swing the ball or hit the ball. And the, the dude's like, okay. So he tried to do it, but because his pants is all baggy or whatever, he couldn't really pay attention and he, he misses and he keeps missing, keeps missing, starts getting frustrated. And the dude's like, you know what, let's, let's pause it. You get paid Friday, go out to the thrift store, just get some, some slacks, get a belt, get a hat, get a college shirt, get some tennis shoes and come back uh, the following Saturday. He ends up doing it and he didn't have to worry about all the distractions. And what does he do? He hits it the first try and immediately the guy's applauding for him. That's the first time he felt support. That's the first time he felt comfortable. That's the first time he had somebody who cheered him on. So when he went home full of excitement, he gets out the car and he sees his friends are laughing at him. Ah, look at him wearing his college shirt. And it's a sardine can. So now this is what made him feel good just by changing his environment a little bit. So to, to continue this, he has to go into this direction, but he had, that's where the conflict comes because now he's going to start pushing away from his friends. Still loves him to death, but they're not giving him what he needs as for himself. Well, long, long story short, he, he continues building with him and then learning about, you know, success, reading books, podcasts, you know, going to these events, staying away from this. And then he starts wanting to help people. And then he wants to go to a school to, to start doing like a YMCA to help kids. And then while he's in his be a business meeting at a restaurant, he overhears people laughing at him. So he turns around and he's like, hey, are, are you laughing at me? <laughs> and, uh, and that's where the story goes full circle, changing the world. So that's what the book's about. I love it. And you don't have a title yet, but I do. I have a title for you. The, pers the perspective reprogram. Ooh. It's totally what I, I learned in NLP, which is neuro linguistic programming. So they say <clears throat> who we are, we, we learn from the age of zero to six. We, we've absorbed all of these things. Think about that zero to six. You think, oh, we were so simplistic. We were just learning how to tie our shoes. No, we were the sardine cans information gatherers. So you saw how your parents were. You saw relationships. You heard things. You, you were, it was repetitive. That's how we learned ABCs. That's how we learned to ride a bike. You do something over and over. Now it's instilled in us. As a life coach, people come and I have to re -pre reprogram their perspective that has been instilled in them for 20, 30, 40 years in the sardine can. I have to clear out all the sardines and we got to put new sardines in there. And your book idea is beautiful because you're relating this to these everyday situations and how easy it is to one day just change, to mm -hmm. say, I have a choice. I do not have to continue what I've been programmed to know that doesn't work for me. I have a choice. And that's always the defining point. I have a choice, no matter what my situation is, whether you're from the inner city or you're from the wealthiest family out there, the choice is, what do I want for me? How do I make that happen? And that is just such a cool story because like you said, you don't know anybody's perspective if you haven't lived it. You can think you do. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry. Um, you can think it because you saw a video on it or you heard somebody talk about it or maybe you read a book on it. You'll never, never know anything through any lens but your own. So what a what a wonderful way of putting that concept in this visual story. I just think it's, I think it's amazing. So it's stopping the cycle of programming that doesn't work for us and reprogramming to, to something that does and a new belief. Cause you mm -hmm. made me think of your character had a new belief. He let go of a, the expectations of others. And then he had this new belief in this willingness to say, okay, well, let me see if this is something new that I can believe in being open-minded. Mm -hmm. So 
if you're going to go out and you're going to talk to, cause that's what your goals are is like you said, to help troubled kids, what are you going to say to them? What is your, how are you going to get through to them? And especially our youth is the future. And if we catch them early, well, you'll hurt my business because usually mine are adults that I have to help. But honestly, uh, I say that jokingly, I want our youth to, to get better. So they're better adults. So what I want to, to train <laughs> the youth is, is I want to reach out. My niche is more of the, the, the high school kids because they, they're, they're more aware of, um, of struggle. You know, they're, they're understanding their sexuality. They're understanding their persona. They're understanding what, what, what makes them tick. And I want to use that as a, as a, as a, use them as a sponge to say that when you go to the gym, you know, you know, you can curl five pounds, but after a while, you're going to need to add five more pounds. And what's going to happen is you have to add five more pounds. And before you know it, now you're at 30 pounds, but what did you have to do? You had to add struggle. Struggle makes strength. So, so, you know, these days, a lot of kids, they just want things to just be handed to them. You know, a lot of kids, you, you can't even ask a kid what they want to do because they're just waiting for, for a knock on the door to be like, all right, Hey, you're going to be a doctor. And Hey, you're going to make this kind of money. And Hey, you're going to get this car and you're going to, and it doesn't work like that. Um, and at the same time, I want to teach them to, to get out of their comfort zone. You know, the comfort zone is actually the most dangerous place that you can be, um, because you don't allow yourself struggle. You don't allow yourself an opportunity to get strong because life is painful and it's going to be painful, but it can be heaven if you've already overcome some of the regular stresses. Like, like, uh, I guess I was talking to a little girl the other day who she says the only time she does chores is when she gets punished or she gets the F in her, her classes. Well, I'm like, all right, well, so what happens when you, you're 18 years old and you move out and you get your own place? Now, the things that you're supposed to do, you don't do because it's a punishment. So I want to be able to, to, to teach these kids because these days, children are, the, are raising children. And, 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 and of course, it's just, it's just slowly but surely just destroying what it is to be human. So I want to go over there and show them that no matter what you can, I want to show them that, that no matter the obstacles, you have to go through it. I was listening to a, a interview with, with Will Smith when he was jumping out of a plane and he said something that literally changed my life. He was talking about when he jumped out of a plane, cause I'm scared of heights and I've jumped out of planes. I'm scared of heights and I've climbed towers. And it's all because of this one in, uh, interview where he was talking about how he was miserable in the night, the, the night before in his bed. He was miserable at, during breakfast. He was miserable on the way there, all because of the fear of jumping out of a plane. But he says the moment he jumped out of the plane, the, the moment of extreme danger, he was in complete bliss. And, I, and he said one thing that just, to this day, I, I want to get it tattooed on me. God puts the most amazing things of life on the other side of fear. Yep. These days, a lot of people aren't doing things because of fear. A lot of these, a lot of days, these, the, a lot of these kids, they have a lot of these insecurities. Well, the reason why they have insecurities is because you're surrounding yourself around other people who talk about other people. You know, oh, look at look at his pants, look at his shoes, look at his, his shirt, look at look at the girl he's talking to, look at the car, look at all of this. So now I'm debating, oh shoot, well, I don't want to wear those pants. And and oh shoot, now you have all these insecurities. Get uncomfortable. Uh, I'm extremely insecure when it comes to my faith, uh, my my body and everything. I am extremely insecure. But instead of hiding it, putting on clothes and more clothes and more clothes to hide it, and I wear spandex. You'll see me walking around in Walmart with spandex. Why? Because I know that there's a million people I see every day that the moment they walk past me, I don't remember them. So let me get uncomfortable with people who's never going to remember me so that now tomorrow is going to be easier. And the day after that's going to be easier. And now I can go to the gym and work out in complete spandex and won't even see a single soul looking at me, even though I'm extremely insecure. So I want to teach kids to, to that there's more to life than what you see on, on social media. Yes. So much to unpack of everything you said. When you see me looking away, I'm like, I got to write that down. I got to write that down. So much here to unpack. You know, it used to say that the youth is entitled. They're an entitlement generation. I think they're an influencer generation. And the problem with the influencer generation is that they're forming their identities based on what other people think and, and comparing themselves to what they see other people doing. And you're only putting your best face out there on social media, right? That's what you do. Yeah. It's, it's a, a filter. It's a, um, I look like I'm just super happy. And you know, you're comparing yourself. It's, it's apples and peanut butter. You know, it's, there's not, there's no comparison. Plus you're on your own journey. 
you're going to be in a different place of every single person in the, on this planet, every single day, you're going to be at a different, on a different race, put the blinders mm -hmm. on. What I want to say is grab them in junior high, grab them in junior high when they're letting go of, or they're forming that identity, which is let go of the child where mom and dad make all the decisions. And before high school, where they've kind of established this identity about themselves, that's where the insecurities, that's where the, a lot of the cutting and the suicide and the addictions come in, get them in junior high. It, it's the roughest period of them letting go of their childhood and grabbing onto adulthood. They get programmed in that period of time and it changes everything. I can appreciate what you're saying because I'm now raising my 14 year old grandson. His mother had him at 17. So yeah, it, it was a struggle. Um, we're working to um, gain custody of him or, or um, guardianship. And he be, he's been through a lot, but he managed to stay strong of mind and decide who he is and what he wants but he's also highly sensitive and I can see some of the trauma and some of the triggers come out when I say something just jokingly and I see the look on his face and I'm like, Whoa, that was a trigger. That was a programming. I got to be more sensitive. So I think you're right. We need more men because my grandson had no men um, to guide him. Now he has my husband and they go at it. And I think it's because he doesn't understand men, how men relate. He's been with women all of his life. And so there was a lot of coddling and, you know, doing things for you. Uh, my husband is a no nonsense engineer. Who's like, nah, man, we do self-sufficiency around here. You know, you have four choices, ride your bike, call an Uber. You know, he's like making him more self-sufficient and we need more men guiding our young men. And we need, we need to tell them this is a big thing because I've done a few podcasts with men. One was about highly sensitive males. We need to tell boys it's okay to feel. You yeah. don't have to be tough. You don't, being emotional is not a bad thing. Expressing yourself is not a bad thing. We've got to change that, that narrative that's been going on forever that you got to be tough because you're a man. Be, you know, be a man, be a real man. Real men don't do this. Like, we got to stop doing that. Right. Mm -hmm. The other thing that, um, I love that you said that's completely, uh, completely relatable here to every area is the settling. So the settling for the mediocre, the, okay, this is just, okay. This is just, this is how it's supposed to be, or this is, this is my life. I don't have any other options. I myself grew up with that mentality of being codependent. So I thought anything bad that happened to me was my fault. And I had to make everyone happy and I had to earn love and I didn't know how to love myself. And now my message is learn to be your own best friend. Cause I never, ever was. I just was like, I have to do this for this person and do this for this person. And the reaction I get is the validation of who I am. So wrong. And that's um, why I'm this accident that I was in was actually a blessing because it it yeah, it was painful, but it taught me so much about my life, but it also taught me a lot about other people's lives. It taught me that that to never listen to other people's words, you actually learn a lot about their reaction or response to, to things that you're going through because them saying that you won't is only telling you what they feel that they couldn't if they were in your shoes, you know, it taught me a lot about en enemies. You know, if, if, if doing a podcast was extremely easy for you, you would never wish that on an enemy. Why? Because you would want something to be hard for them. So you're going to, you're going to start putting them through things that would be hard for you. So anytime somebody treats you some type of way, all they're doing is telling you what would hurt them, you know? So I learned a lot from, from, from um, this accident. I learned that, that, yeah, you know, a, a lot of times, you know, we are our own main character of any story. I don't care if it's a movie, a book, something that you're just gossiping about. You are your own main character. But the thing is, is you're also the director of your story, too. Um, when they told me that I was going to need neck surgery, that was the first time I cried. I think it was three months after my accident. That was the first time I cried. And I went into a stage I call hell. I said it was utter hell. Like, I got to the point where I actually accepted where I was at. I accepted, like, this is going to be the rest of my life. 
if I go, if I, you know, if he messes up with my neck, I'm going to be paralyzed for the rest of my life. And I just, and I, I, I went through a, a, a really bad depression. And the only way that I can, can, can put this into like a visual is how many movies have you watched where everybody's partying, 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 and then they take a drink and then it blacks out and they wake up and they're tied up to a chair or a table in a basement. And the look, the first look on their face is, wait, what's going on? And then once they start looking around, then it hits them. This is real. And then they accept it. That's where I was at. But the great thing about it is, is, is yeah, it may seem like I'm in a horror story, but since I'm the director, I'm going to turn this into a spiritual one. And I got up. You know, they, you always see the, the 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 good guy or the the victim. Eventually, he's like, you know what? No, I'm not going to allow this. And they fight back. I fought back. And so this accident has 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 changed the way that my just the perspective of life. Like like I I I is I'm actually very lonely now because of my perspective. Because these days, all you hear all you hear from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep is complaining, 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 complaining. And I'm like, you can breathe. You can walk. You can enjoy the heat. Like, yeah, it's hot, but you can feel. You have the power to feel. Like, what are you complaining about? And and so that and that's just how I am. And it's just, it's, I want to show people that there's so much more to, to life. Like, like I'm, I'm, people have called me extremely sensitive because I just love seeing life now. You know, to, to, to hear a child laugh just just melts me to 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 see a dog running around and just wagging its tail a lot of people get frustrated like, oh my god my dog won't leave me alone and I'm like you're upset because something loves you you're upset because something's craving for you to come home and and so my entire life has just just unfolded it's just amazing and so it's to the point now where even my my daily rituals I wake up and I put on a motivational speech on YouTube everybody's like well why do you do that why do you do that you you know about ET you know about uh, David Goggins, you know about all this. You've always heard it. Why are you doing this? I said, because I want to wake up listening to something that speaks to me rather than waking up and talking about other people. Yes. Yes. And, and that's why, and that's what I do. Oh, Adam, Adam, my soul brother. Oh my God. I just love your spirit. So much you, you're saying, first of all, you have a new appreciation for life. You have a new gratitude for life. Someone who has not been at death's door cannot appreciate life the way that you do. It's the small things. Um, I was almost killed. I was in a domestic violence marriage and, um, I was almost killed. He, he was, uh, strangling me and I was minutes away from dying. And I remember the blackness, you know, closing in and I never knew what that meant. And I managed to superhumanly get him off. And I took that first breath and I'm like, oh my God, I was seconds away from dying with my two, my little toddlers in the next room. I'm going to find mom dead. And so I have this appreciation too for getting out of, and I continued these abusive relationships. Now I'm like you, I saw a red dragonfly the other day, which is like super rare and super wonderful. Nobody else is going to notice a red dragonfly, but me, I'm like you, the little things you said something so amazing to me, which is I'm, I'm very lonely now because, and this is what I learned, Adam, this is, this is, I'm going to be your mama and your coach for one second. And it is by clearing people out that don't belong there, you will draw in like me, people that belong there that are more aligned with you and more at your vibration. And you're going to notice now more than ever, the people who don't belong there, you're going to feel how that vibration is lower and how it's just not who you are anymore. You outgrew it because you had this pain to purpose experience and now it's like, oh yeah, I got room. When I do dating coaching, I always say to everybody, if you're dating someone that you don't think is committed to marriage, or you don't feel like you're a great match, I said, you need to say, get out of my husband's way. You know, it's get, you know, when you have friends, friends that are toxic, friends that don't support you, get out of my best friend's way. You know, it's, it's really that your attitude. What I tell clients is change it from I have to, to I get to. Like you said, the dogs, the work, the sunshine, the, you know, everything you do during your day, you get to do those who don't get to do it are six feet under and past. But as long as you're here breathing on this earth, you get to do everything you're doing. Yeah. And the greater the pain, the greater the healing. And I always say, when you've experienced something that's really traumatic or painful, you'll know you're healed when you have a gratitude for it. And you've said that several times in this podcast, 
this was a blessing, right? This was a blessing, right? You're at that place. You're at that place where you're like, yeah, man, I'm healed because I have gratitude for what happened. You know, I, I just, oh, I lift you because this is so perfect. That's hard to explain to others, isn't it? That haven't been there. Um, yes and no. So I actually, on the fifth of this month, I actually just finalized my divorce and the divorce was basically due because I'm toxically positive. Mm -hmm. And so, so when people hear that, they're like, wait a minute, that's not a real thing. I said, yes, it is a real thing. It is, it is a hundred percent a real thing. You know, you're, you, you have emotions specifically for a reason. They're tools. You know, when you're frustrated, something's off. When you're angry, there's a reason why like, there, there's, there's, there's tools that you're supposed to go off of and understand why you feel these ways and move accordingly. I said, but, but being toxically positive, me being toxically positive to you is damn near impossible because anything that I say is only advice. It's only going to be toxic if you allow it or if you agree to it. But other than that, it's just advice. You can't get mad at me for not getting mad at things that make you mad. I don't care about that person that's in the fast lane who's driving slow because it's not affecting me. You know, and, and even if it was affecting me, I, I'm not going to get mad at it at a at a pothole. 10 minutes pat after I pass the pothole. No, it's just an obstacle. Go around it and keep going. When somebody cuts you off, you, you know, a lot of people slam on the brakes and get road rage or whatever. And I'm like, no, them, them cutting in front of you may have possibly saved you, slowed you down enough from, from, from having the accident you would have had two miles from now. So yeah, you can be angry that it happened, but look at the obstacle as, as that. It's already done. It's already over. You didn't die. You didn't get hurt. Yeah, it scared you, but who knows? You may, probably needed that to bring you more awareness. You probably needed somebody to do that because if you didn't, you would have probably been looking at your phone and you would have probably hurt somebody. But and but I'm toxically positive. If I'm toxically positive, my positivity has never put me in jail. My positivity has never put me in harm's way. My positivity has opened up my, my been a, is allowing me to wake up. My hell, my to toxic positivity is allowing me to look outside of this beautiful weather, even though it's storming outside right now. Like, I love it, you know? It, why why get angry at other people who don't get angry? Yeah. So I got a divorce because of it. And and I get it. I'm divorced twice and now finally with someone who completely gets me wholeheartedly and is a twin flame, not just a soulmate, but a twin flame, like the other half of who I am. And <clears throat> it's a big difference. It is a big difference. And yeah, I, I'm so sorry for the divorce, but I'm also not sorry because you, again, stay in alignment with who you are and toxically positive. What I've learned from <laughs> overcoming being a codependent and a self-sabotager is I'm not responsible for how you receive something. I'm not responsible how, for how you receive who I am. I'm just going to be my authentic self. And what I have found is people have fallen away, Adam, and it has been for good reason. And in, some things took me longer and I had to repeat those same lessons. Um, I've just ended a relationship, a friendship of 18 years because my eyes were finally open that this had been going on for a very long time <clears throat> and I didn't feel loved. I didn't feel appreciated. I, I was in those old habits of, I got to earn this friendship. I got to earn this love. And then I had to go hold on, hold on. Aha moment. You're doing it again, Maureen. So you're going to go back into these cycles. What's interesting is you're going to experience them in different ways. I thought, Oh, I got out of toxic relationships. I'm great at this recognizing people who don't appreciate me. And then it was with my child, my very own child who I'm estranged from my daughter. Um, in a same thing, different person, different presentation, and then I'm like, oh, no, I got this. I'm not going to let my daughter do that. And then friendship. Oh, man, presented itself again. You know, you're just I'm going, am I just a slow learner or is this just me getting the whole picture through and through fully of what's not supposed to be meant for me? And I always say nothing meant for you will miss you. We have to clear out our sardine can, uh, right, in order to attract law of attraction. You know, Abraham Hicks talks about law of attraction. If you've ever listened to Abraham Hicks, it's mm -hmm. 
it's really just staying in our high flying disc and those who aren't up there with us that we can't help that. We can't force anybody to come along. We came alone, we leave alone. So our journey and our purpose is do the best for ourselves. And I know programming, as we talked about perspective reprogramming was don't be selfish. Don't be self-absorbed. Don't be self-centered. Think of all the self things that were a negative. Now we've reframed to self-care, self-love, self-worth. You know, it's, that's kind of why I love the mental health awareness now is we're finally embracing that it's okay to take care of you. You're here for you. You have your life to live no longer being responsible for anyone else. Mm -hmm. You never, you never know how bad you feel until you start to feel good. And the thing is, is once you start to feel good, that's like, that's like an image that you've seen and you can't take out. You know, I've already seen it. You know, I've, I've seen this, this image for 30 years. But now I flipped it over, I see this image. And I'm like, what? Now, every time I look at it, I can't go back to not seeing it. It's the same concept. You never know how bad you feel until you start feeling good. And once you start feeling good, you don't, you don't have a choice but to stay away from what it was. And that's another thing I want to tell, tell, teach the kids is the only way you can do that is trying new things. You know, get, get, in, get into the, every, you know, these days, everybody needs to be the top of their friends. They have to be the best. They need to have the, the most money. They need to be the strongest. They need to have the most relationships. They need to have everything up here. But me, I'm the exact opposite. I want to be at the very bottom of my friends, because if I'm at the very bottom of my friends, I don't have a choice but to go up. You know, um, I want to be, uh, I don't, if, you, if you're at the top, you don't have a choice but to get, go down. Because if you're even at the top, now these people down here are going to be talking bad about you. So now you're going to keep from, and that's where you're going to get your insecurities. No, um, enjoy being wrong. I love love with an utter passion being wrong. And everybody calls me crazy for that, or they try to, to demonize me because I love being wrong. No, it's an opportunity to learn something new. Everybody needs to be right. And then you needing to be right is, is the reason why you've missed out on so many things because you're not allowing yourself, you're putting a wall into growth. When I'm wrong, it allows me to learn something new. I can know for a fact I'm right, but if you say something that teaches me something, I'm not gonna just sit here and fight here. Uh, growth, <laughs> take this and incorporate it. So now you can now spread it to other people. Yes. I, I, oh man, I'm so on board with that. Uh, and I'm going to take it further. I never want to be the smartest person in the room. I don't ever, ever, ever. ever. I need nuggets. That's why I love this. This is a mutually beneficial. I give, you give, I take, you take, like, I always want people around me where it's this, it's this exchange. The getting rid of toxic people is when you're not getting anything back and you're not learning and you're not growing. I had a quote in my book that I wrote that said, uh, and I can't remember who, who quoted it, which is weird. Um, it said, I never learned any from anything from anyone who agreed with me a hundred percent, you know, yeah. I, I, that's it. Like, I don't want, to, I don't want someone in front of me that just echoes and jet and mirrors everything that I am. I want different. I love that's why for me, the biggest thing is, is inclusivity. Like I want to know how you tick and why you believe in this thing. And I think COVID did us a justice because I think we finally with the ba Black Lives Movement, I think we finally are embracing LGBTQ. We're finally saying it's time to stop thinking we're right about everything. And I love what you said. I love being wrong. I love being wrong because I love owning it. I love being like, Oh, damn. Didn't know that. Now I know something today, something I now, didn't know. But now what you also understand, too, is why social media is so. It's a parasite. It's a virus, because what happens is you notice that everybody has an opinion. And in the moment somebody doesn't agree with you, it's an argument. If you're in that mindset. Yeah. And, it, right? and the thing is, well, that's re the, the thing is, though, is, is you are your surroundings. So if everybody around you slowly but surely you start growing that mindset, oh, wait, no, I know this. And no, I know this. And now I know this. So now two plus two equals four. And now you have 36 comments of, of no, but it's six. And no, 
just learn. <laughs> yeah. And it's what you're ingesting. So, you know, and that's one of the reasons uh, I have a Facebook group called mindfulness and positivity seekers. And every day I put in this, you know, these positive things in my life coach page. Um, and when I'm scrolling and I see negativity, I scroll on by, I don't bother with it because it doesn't, it doesn't affect me because I don't want to ingest that into my sardine can. I love how I'm, oh, I'm yeah. using your sardine can. I'm going to so use that and play and pay that forward. Um, I don't want to ingest things that aren't serving me. Why do I want to take the negativity? And if I need to argue with you with someone to make my point, then I'm wasting my time and energy because they're not at a place of wanting to learn from me anyway. Now I'm inserting my, my belief in you. What's the point? You've got to come to that conclusion on your own. That's self-awareness, baby. And like you said earlier, we can't unsee it. Once you start this journey of self-awareness, you can't un-self-aware. I don't care what anybody says. Now you can stay stuck not being self-aware, but I don't think once you get to self-awareness that you can go backwards. Mm -hmm. And that's when you, like I always say, I feel souls. I don't see people. I feel you. I feel your energy. As soon as I see someone, I'm like, I get you. I feel you. Oh yeah. This is going to be good. And, and especially this podcast, you're, you're going to appreciate this. My only goal for this year, and I don't do a new year's resolutions. I don't tell my clients to, I just say, there's something I want to achieve this year. And I have a timeline. Like you said, the marathons you're training. You're like, I love that you put no later than 2023. I'm the same way. I'm like, in this year, this is what I'm going to do. So this year was start a podcast. January comes, nothing. February. And I had just retired from a corporate job of 26 years in December. So now I'm like scrambling to find some fulfillment, right? Or validation. I start refurbishing furniture. I start selling on eBay. I'm like, what are you trying to do here? I waited and waited. My fear was I'm, I'm over 50, man. I, I am half a century old. I, this technology thing, I'm not great at the whole marketing. And one day I was sitting down and just, I create these little mini houses. I'll show you. I, I show everybody. I create these little mini houses. So this is a little replica, replica of my office. Okay. Yeah. Super fun. Right. Um, I was just doing one of those and all of a sudden it said, start the podcast. And nobody's in the room. No one's around. And I was like, excuse me, I'm busy here. <laughs> and they're like, start the podcast. This was at the end of June. I have now, I have um, episodes booked already six months out. I mean, recorded, published six months out. And the list is growing and growing and growing. Build it and they will come. But what happened? My fear said, you're not ready. You're not ready. And that is okay too. I'm going to say this, Adam, it is okay to say, you know what? I'm not ready, but I'm going to be there. I'm going to get ready. And then when that moment of readiness comes, then you've got intuition, you've got inspiration and you're like, damn, this is fun. And this is easy. That's where I'm at. Every single guest like you that comes, these, these are not just, oh, let's just talk about business and how great we are. This okay. is like, I'm so connected with you. I, I feel feel you. I see you. We are one big tribe and it's better when you're more prepared and you're, you're cleared out of all the stuff that's negative and resistant and these limiting beliefs that you have, you can welcome with open arms and it's just easy and it flows. Right. And God puts the best things of life on the other side of fear. Yes. Fear is face everything and rise. That's yeah. it. That's it. That that's everything in a nutshell. Get on the other side. And when you look back, you're like, damn, that wasn't that hard. Think of all the things you did that were hard. I tell, I tell my clients all the time, think of all the things you've done in life that were hard. Okay. You came into a world, first of all, being born, that is hard. Second of all, you had to learn how to feed yourself. You had to learn how to walk. You had to learn how to ride a bike. You had to learn how to read. You had to learn how to socialize with people. You had to learn how to decide things for yourself, what works and what doesn't. So there's nothing in your life that you ever have to be like, yeah, I can't do that because there's nothing you haven't already accomplished. Looking forward, people go, that's really hard. And I'll go, well, why don't you just look backwards? And they're like, oh yeah, I did do that. Didn't I? 
I forgot about that. I tell people that all the time. I say, and I, I, um, I did an interview the other day and they said, um, why do you like, how are you able to continue doing this? How are you, how are you able to get onto the bike? How are you able to get onto the speed skates? How are you able to swim and, and attempt running and all that stuff? How are you able to do it? And I said, because I look back at every single time that I knew for a fact that this was going to kill me. I knew this relationship was going to kill me. I knew that this, this loss of the job was going to kill me. I know me, me being homeless was going to kill me. I knew all this was going to kill me. And here I am still today. So if every single time I knew that that was going to be the end and I continued, why is this moment going to be different? Yeah. Yeah. And you got to have a mantra. So my mantra is from Abraham Hicks. And anytime something seems like a struggle, I just go, everything's always working out for me. Always. Yeah. Everything's always, always working out for me. So as we close up, I always ask two questions. You're marching downtown in your city and there's a hundred thousand people behind you and you're holding a banner. What does your banner say? Good morning. That's <laughs> it. That is it. That is it. Good morning. Oh. So can I, can I say it? And the, and the thing is, you know, I didn't even have to think about it. So um, it's clearly not even morning right now. It's afternoon. And the reasoning why is, I have been doing this since 2008, saying good morning only. And the reason why is because when I joined the military, I was not a morning person. Um, to wake up, I had to fake the funk. I had to get in my, mu uh, turn on the music and I'd jam out and I would ride to, into bass and I'd be dancing, you know, good morning, good morning, good morning. And I realized that no matter how many pe people were upset, they'd still smile. Oh, Rivera, it's not morning, man. They'd smile. Well, I was doing that, doing just doing it just for fun, going out to the to all the way to e, top of Equad and Schofield Barracks and screaming, good morning, Equad. Just shut up, Rivera, it's too early for that. Well, <laughs> it, it took for me to go into a Walmart or a Publix. I think it was a Walmart. And I said, good morning. And she said, good morning. She's like, it's six o'clock in the afternoon. I said, what's the first thing you did when I said good morning? She said, she said, I looked at my watch. I said, you smiled. And she dropped everything and she ran across the corner and she gave me the biggest hug. And it caught me off guard. I thought she was flirting with me, whatever. And I said, are you all right? And she said, and she just started crying. She said, I was planning on committing suicide later. <gasps> she says, for that, that split second, I completely forgot about that because I was trying to figure out why you were saying good morning. And then when you responded back with a smile, that's the first smile I had all day long. And I told myself from now on, anytime, I don't know anybody's life. I don't know anybody's current day. I don't know what traumas they're going through or whatever. So anytime somebody ever experiences me, it's going to be what it's going to start off with a smile. And I have been doing it since 2008. Guess how many people have not smiled? Zero. 16. 16 people haven't smiled. 16 people in every single, and people are like, oh my God, you count, you count, you count. I said, no, I don't count. I said, picture being a comedian and, and Kevin Hart, Kevin Hart goes out there and every single time he goes out there before he even says a word, they're all shouting and laughing and laughing and laughing. Well, now let picture Kevin Hart in a month from now going on stage and he's cracking up jokes and not one person laughs. He doesn't have to count it because he feels it yeah. when they don't smile. I feel it. And I'm just like, oh, well, 16. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not counting it. <laughs> but how can you make him smile? How can you go further? That's What's your it? job. That's your job. Don't leave them. Don't leave it at that. Oh, what no, do you... I don't. Leave. I, no, I don't. Go further. What do you do further? Okay. If they're not smiling, I got to do something more to break through oh. to this person. Oh, no. Honestly, when they're not smiling, I'll just tell them that story. When I tell them that story, now they feel it like, oh, wow. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'm going something. Maybe what can I do to fix me? Yeah. So yeah. I just, you know, like, are you all right? You know, and I tell them the story. And then once I tell them the story, they're like, you know what? You're right. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have re reacted this way. I shouldn't have done this. And they, uh, not one of those people have ever gotten angry with me. If anything, all of them ended it with a smile. Nice. Nice. Yeah. a boy. That's what I wanted to hear. Cause I feel like you're just a light worker in this world and you're like, my hashtag goals is leave them better than you found them. Yes. And, I, and you're right there with me. It's like, um, if they're not smiling, then you came across their path to do something to make them smile. So mm -hmm. God, I love it. One last question. What is your shameless self-indulgence? What do you mean? The thing you do for you that may be weird, wacky, or wonderful that Ooh. nobody else probably does and or or everybody does, whatever it is. So a lot of people call me crazy for this, but um, I'm actually in therapy right now because I am deathly afraid of everything. And because I'm deathly afraid of everything, 
I intentionally chase my fears. That's why I jumped out of planes. That's the reason why my job, well, I'm, I hate I hate fighting. I'm petrified to ever get into a fight, but I did protection work. I would, went to the military. I always chase my fears to the point that even I'm insecure. I don't, uh, I don't, I'm not gonna say anything too inappropriate, but um, because I'm, in, I'm insecure, I actually became, uh, became a nude model for art classes. Nice. So I, I chase fear. That's, that's, and I don't do it intentionally, like as a thrill, I just do it as more of bro. But the moment I experience something that's scary, <laughs> cool. Give me a ticket. We break, let's go. And yeah. we go. I, yeah. I've never jumped. I'm never uh, bungee jumping. Never doing that. I don't care. I, I'm never facing that. Fear. I don't want to face that fear. But anything else I'm doing. I love that. I love that. I, you know what? I, I'm, I'm the same way. I have learned now to embrace the excitement and the nervousness and the fear. It, it kind of tells me I'm at a road block. I'm not a roadblock. I'm at, I'm at a, a place where, oh, this is a movement. This is something I'm facing is something I haven't done before. So this is something I've got to do, you know? Excitement and nervousness are typically the same thing. Yeah. It's just perceived differently. Your heart races, you're, you're, you're shaking, you're, you're this, you're that. And your heart's rate, like everything is exactly the same. It's just, you're seeing it as in, okay, this is going to be fun or this is going to be painful. That's yes. All well, and what you do, um, just from a psychology background, um, is you do extreme countermeasures. It's a coping mechanism for you where you're like extreme, um, ex like fear exposure. So you're mm -hmm. like, and, and that's, I think it's really healthy. I think it's really great. You're not putting yourself, um, in harm's way and it's not terrifying you or paralyzing you. You're actually facing it. And that's the only way we do grow. So you do really your coping mechanism is to countermeasure. You're, you're going to do a counter thing that if I have a negative emotion, I'm going to counter it. And then I'm not going to have that negative emotion. So it's a great, co I think it's a great coping mechanism. Um, it's difficult, but I, I, I enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. Unless you have like an addiction to adrenaline and then, then that's oh, yeah. something. Yeah. That's something that, that we have to just moderate a little bit, <laughs> but thank you so much for being on my podcast today. Did, did I lie? Did I not tell you it's like having coffee with your sis? Honestly, this was amazing. If I could do this every day, invite me because this was, this was, I needed this. I need this a lot. Ah, oh, I love it. I needed it too. I needed it too. There are no coincidences, coincidences, and there are no accidents. There is only alignment and attraction. And here we are, my friend. And, you know, I'm kooky like this, but you are now my friend for life. So you're not going to outrun me. Tell us if you have someone that wants to get a hold of you to chat, to reach out, where can they find you? Uh, they can find me on Facebook. Just Google my, or search my name, Adam Rivera. Uh, my picture is the same picture I've had since I had Facebook and it's uh, a gray and white picture of me and my daughter sitting above me. Um, or then you can go on my Instagram. It's the underscore reference underscore book. And that's also my blog name, the reference book.com. Um, so you'll see all of my, I think, 100, 200 blogs, blog posts I've ever had just about changing perspectives on that. Um, and then I think I have a YouTube channel called the reference book as well, but you just can't find it. <laughs> that's... And then you'll, you'll see my, my story on there as well. And I'll have all of those links when we post your podcast too. And it'll be on Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, and Insta. So everyone will be able to find you. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed Adam as much as I did. And if you do have questions for him or you want to find him, you can always come through me. And if you need life coaching, you're interested in life coaching, relationship coaching, business coaching, spiritual coaching, find me at lifecoachmaureen.com. I also am on Instagram at Life Coach Maureen. And if you would like to buy my books and we didn't get to talk dogs today, it is National Dog Day. Uh, my, my books are available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble and everywhere you buy books. And you can see them in the background here. My dog is more enlightened than I am. And my dog is my relationship coach. Dogs teach us to stay in alignment with who we are, be aligned with what our purpose is and to just live a chill fun life and stay in joy. So Adam, been a pleasure, my brother. We're going to be friends from here on out. Thank you for your time. You gave me an hour. You're never going to get back and it's a gift. And I have 
a, a gratitude that you don't even know. So thank you for a wonderful conversation today. And uh, we'll be talking soon. All right. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> thank you, honey. All right.